The next in-person uh, lecture it will be on Tuesday, March 19th, here at noon. And uh, Center Fellow Shankao will be giving the lecture, What Does Quantum Mechanics Tell Us About Reality? And you're all invited to listen to his uh, talk. On Friday, March 22nd, we will have uh, the penultimate uh, uh, lecture in the annual lecture series given by physicist Nicole Younger Halper who will be talking about field notes on the second law of thermodynamics from a quantum physicist. Uh, she, she, she has something called quantum punk. Is that the name of her, of her lab? Yeah. yeah, something like that, which is actually a really interesting lab. I have <laughs> a great website in any case. And the program for the last conference at the center, Revitalizing Science and Values, organized by Arnon uh, Levy, our senior visiting fellow this semester, will be taking, uh, is available online on the center's website. So please have a look at the program. All right, thanks for coming uh, uh, to uh, today's lecture. What I want to be talking about is uh, some work on obedience. And I have some uh, bad news to give you about all of you. So I hope you won't leave this room too uh, depressed. So let's suppose you uh, get an invitation to take part in an experiment and you decide for the amazing amount of five dollars to go to that experiment you enter the lab and there are two people waiting for you one is wearing a lab coat she's obviously a uh, lab assistant or maybe a psychologist you don't really know and one is uh, just like you wearing casual clothes uh, another participant you introduce yourself uh, the, the psychologist the lab assistant gives you two uh, randomly two paper two pieces of paper that you must read on yours, it's written teacher. On the other participants, it's written learner. All right, everybody gets the setting so far? So it means that you are going to be the teacher in a learning experiment. The other person is going to be the learner in this learning experiment. All right? This is the place where you are in, the room where you are in, actually. There's a weird table. You're going to be sitting on this chair. And in front of you, there is this weird machine. Now, you go to the next room, and the first thing you do in the next room is you sit the other participant, the learner, on a chair with the help of the psychologist. And you put some electrodes on that person because you're told you're going to be, as part of the learning experiment, giving electric shock to that person. And then you leave the room. And you go back to the main room, the room you enter to, and you sat and you, and you sit. All right? So that's going to be you, the learner that you had to sit a minute ago, and there's an experimenter here that is actually checking what you are doing. In front of you, you have this wheel machine, which I've already showed you. It has uh, switches like that that you can move up and down. You are explained that whenever you move a switch, the learner, the person in the other room, will receive an electric shock. And you can see they are grouped by four. The first one is something like very mild, even so I don't want to really read what's written. It goes to danger, severe shock, and then it goes to X, X, X. It's not a porn <laughs> website. <laughs> it just means it's just very bad. So, uh, and it goes from, uh, I think, 15 to 450, right? And so whenever the learner will make a mistake in the learning task, you will have to give him a reinforcement, a punishment, to see whether his or her performance, his performance, the first experiment, improves as a function of the feedback, the literature shot, that the participant is given. All right, let me uh, show you very quickly uh, a video made by the psychologist.
um, participants get to be quite reluctant to shop. When they say no, they don't want to shop, they get four prompts in a row, it's scripted. Uh, and the psychologist is slowly increasing, just saying, no, please continue until you must continue. If after hearing must continue, the participant says, I want to leave, then the person is allowed, is allowed to leave. Right? And what you're measuring really here is how long participants are going to be, to be shocking the, the, um, uh, the, the learner in the audience. Needless to say, the learner is not a real learner. Uh, it's a confederate, no one is getting shocked here, um, but, but the person is still willing to do that. That says it was a 1930 experiment where people had to kill a, ch a, a live chicken. So it was a 1930 version, and, and there was a real live chicken, it was not a fake chicken. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so there's uh, antecedents to that, to that study about obedience. Now the question I want to ask you is, what would you do? So how many of you wouldn't shop until 4.50? <laughs> wait, wait, would not? Again? How many of you wouldn't would go to the maximum? How many of you would stop before the end? Third <laughs> 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 huh? How many of you would go to the end? Exactly. <laughs> you were like totally deluded about yourself. <laughs> Was that was that Trump taking the cognitive test on the other? I want to change my answer. The study was taken to be revealing a phenomenon called um, uh, destructive obedience. So destructive obedience is the fact that under minimal constraint, namely here someone is just telling you, please continue, you must continue, there's no physical violence, under minimal constraint, knowing that what they are doing is wrong. A large proportion of people are actually willing to cause harm to us. This is a phenomenon of destructive obedience. Um, this is that phenomenon here, that this gentleman here uh, uh, was illustrating for you a few minutes ago. Now, what I want to tell you a bit today, I will, I will tell you a bit more about the experiment, just giving you the basic framework and tell you about where it comes from. Then I can I describe a very influential objection that has been raised against, that against that study. <laughs> then we'll do a small detour to, to just around some issues around uh, the work by Milgram, and then we'll get back to the hypothesis. <laughs> All right, so the study I've, I've shown you earlier was uh, developed by uh, Stanley uh, Milgram, 1933. 1984. He's an extremely famous psychologist. If you don't, do not know him, he made several contributions to social psychology. You probably know that each of us, or believe that each of us is separated for, from someone else by seven degrees of separation. He's the one, four, six, six. six. He's the one who did that experiment. Uh, you probably know the lost, the lost letter paradigm to measure altruism. He's the one who developed this experiment. So throughout his career, he made massive contributions to the development of social psychology. In a way that's very original, while social psychology nowadays takes place in a lab, it's very regimented. Much of his work, not all his work, was taking place in the wild, in natural experiment, trying to measure natural behavior. It's extremely influential, according to an article published in the Review of General Psychology in 2002, with the 47 most cited psychologists of the 20th uh, century. Um, in 1963, he published this article here, Behavioral Study of Evidence, in the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology, JASP. It was, his first, it was his first article. It reports a single experiment. By our modern standards, a very unusual article. It's very narrative. It's very exploratory. There's no hypothesis tested. It reports just a strange phenomenon that he's been observing in his paper. It was a start of a series of studies where he made small variation on the experimental design I've, I've described to you earlier. 24 studies were completed. 18 of them were reported in his book in 1974, a very important book. I wanted to bring it to you today, but of course, I forgot it at home when I left this morning. So I can't, I can't show you. It's a wonderful book. It's short. Uh, it's very well written. But that described 18 experiments, variation on the same, on the same experimental uh, design. Now, let me tell you a bit more about the 1963 experiment. In 1961, Milgram received his PhD from social psychology at Harvard. 
He got hired in 1960, just before getting his PhD by Yale. So, you know, first, first job, quite prestigious position. And he starts teaching very quickly. Uh, one of the classes he teaches uh, in 1961 is this course with the undergraduates called Psychology of Small Groups. And there he develops new experiments to give psychologists a sense of how to use one-way mirror. He wanted to, to, to teach them how to use techniques, really. And as part of this experiment, he develops the basic structure of the obedience experiments I gave you earlier. And it works tremendously. The undergraduates are extremely excited. The results are shocking. So he decides to run it for real at Yale in 1961 uh, in the basement of uh, Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Chittenden Hall. He recruits 40 male participants. They're from the broader population. They're not undergraduates. The paper is quickly written. It's a very short paper. It's a very unusual. It's kind of a very casual, breezy uh, way of writing. Um, it's originally rejected by uh, the Journal of Personality, which is a leading journal in the field. It's submitted to the uh, Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology, which is also a good journal, slightly less, less prestigious than Journal of Personality. It's originally rejected, uh, but for some curious reason, um, I guess uh, Milgram was lucky, it's accepted <laughs> in 1962, and that's his first publication. Uh, just imagine you're making a first publication that's making you a world star. Uh, this is quite, quite, quite a lucky break. Um, in 1964, after a few things, which I'll tell you in a few, in a few minutes, he gets uh, the AAAS Prize for Behavioral Science uh, Research. He also gets an NSF uh, uh, award to actually carry the whole sequence of, of 18 studies that are the matter of the 1974, 1974 uh, book. I will use the word experiment to describe the 1963 studies that I will describe a bit more now. It's not really an experiment. There's no control condition. You know, it's just, it's just an observation of people's behavior in an artificial setting with one manipulation. Okay, we've already seen that picture. Just to remind you, this is a structure of the 1963 experiment, right? You're here, you, are, uh, you have to, the learner is supposed to learn some association between words. When the learner is making a mistake, you're supposed to shock him. And as the learner makes mistakes, you're supposed to increase the intensity of the shock. When you say you want to stop, when you object, you're given four prompts. At the end of the four prompts, you can leave. The dependent measure is how long you keep from 50 to 450. Here are the results of the first study. Uh, it's taken from uh, the paper. Uh, the 1963 paper at 300, as you can see, no one stopped before 300 volt. At 300 volt, the first in that study, the first time the learner, the person in, in uh, the Confederate, mm -hmm. protests. So until before 300, no one protests. You're just choking and choking. At 300, the person asks, "I want to leave. I want to stop." Only five people. Leave. Only five people stop. And then he protests, then the learner stops protesting. We don't know what has happened to him. People keep going. 26 of the 40 participants go to 450. As you can see, they're all marked on the machine, XXX. It's written very clearly, danger, severe shock, extreme intensity shock, <laughs> intense shock, and so on and so forth. So that, that's the same study that's part of the book. You see that from the book. That's a subset of the studies that Neil Graham has conducted. This are the first four studies. As you can see, you get variation in numbers depending on many factors. Exactly what would you be expecting? Do you see the participants being shocked? Is the participant close to you? Is a psychologist calling you from a phone or through a phone? You know, so there's a lot of factors that influences people's disposition to obey. But in all of them, there's a, there's a very large proportion of participants who are willing under minimal constraint to cause harm, knowing that what they're doing is actually wrong. And that's again the phenomenon of uh, um, um, obedience, uh, destructive obedience. In, so that's also something that's going to be mattering. People report being quite stressed. And, and as you've seen from the picture, now, let's be clear it's a movie meant by Milgram. So Milgram, as a clever, clever chap that he was, made the movie the most, that was the most impressive as he could, right? So it's not exactly a depiction of the reality, <laughs> it's through, the, through an artistic bent. But still, when you look at the data, it's very clear. So it's very clear. That's of course the data from the first from four studies and the reported in the book. A large proportion of them report being extremely nervous. And it's very clear from actually, I've seen many clips from many replications. So there's a large proportion of people who are literally sweating 
and, and, and shaking throughout the experiment. Now, it's important to distinguish the phenomenon from the explanation of the phenomenon. So what I've described to you is just a phenomenon. Right? I haven't told you why people engage in destructive obedience. And it's actually quite controversial. In fact, we don't really know why people engage in destructive obedience. Milgram himself didn't care at all for theory. He was just interested in phenomena. All his work is about, he has an interesting phenomenon about human beings. That's the way he made his career, and he was extremely talented at that. Um, but, but because he had to write some theory in order to get published, you know, you need a discussion section and an introduction, he came up with some kind of theory, which he calls the agentic step theory, which is theory between scare quotes, uh, which just view ourselves as agent. So when somehow something removes our sense of agency, we, we view ourselves just as tool, and so we, we don't take ourselves to be responsible for the events. The very simple, very simple idea. So, you know, the, the teacher is, does not view himself as an agent, so he does not, it does not take himself or herself, but himself in the own experiment to be responsible for, for the behavior. It's quite a controversial theory. Many people think there's something wrong with it. An influential theory has been developed by Alexander Haslam that says it's really much more about the willingness to contribute to a common, to a common project. So psychologist, the learner and the teacher are part of a group that are contributing to a project, increasing the amount of knowledge, a scientific project that they view as being good. And that's why they're doing that. Today, it won't matter at all what the explanation is. I just wanted to mention it's controversial what the explanation is. We don't really know. What the question of this lecture is whether destructive obedience is a real phenomenon or not, whether much of you would be willing to hurt me if you were in that situation. Uh, and I'm sad to say that the answer is yes. <laughs> Now, the phenomenon has an enormous impact both on science and on the broader world. Uh, it's part of every single textbook in psychology. You can't go to Psych 101 without learning about Milgram's experiment. It's really basic psychology. Movies have been made about Milgram's. Books have been made about Milgram's. There's a 1995 movie about Milgram's. There's a bunch of biography. Uh, made about his work, mostly driven by the obedience experiment. Well, I think the rest of his work is really quite remarkable. This is the obedience experiment that I've made him very famous. And not only that, the work has also been used beyond psychology to explain other phenomena. It's not just an explanet, an, an explanendum, it has been used as an explanet. So for example, in this very important, very controversial book by Browning about why ordinary people engage uh, in genocide in Germany, uh, the main explanation is actually an appeal to Milgram, uh, an appeal to the phenomenon of destructive obedience. Not an accident, because Milgram himself, uh, from a Jewish family who suffered from the Holocaust, uh, thought about the whole study in light of, of what had happened in Germany. So it's not quite an accident that scholars much later also help themselves of um, uh, Milgram's, Milgram's Tremendous impact. The impact has been varying a little bit across time, Ex extraordinary impact in the 1960s, 70s, slow down and re-emerge and so forth, as you would expect from any cultural phenomenon. And the lucky man, I'm not sure whether I want to, I'm running a little bit late, let me see. The so lucky man not only had an impact on academia, also an impact on broader culture. Uh, one of my favorite albums of the 1980s by Peter Gabriel, it's a new wave album, so after he left Genesis, uh, uh, actually has a whole song dedicated to, uh, to Milgram. I think I, I will have you listen to five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good music. So I think if you don't know it, okay, we'll, we'll skip the other. Um, there's a classic TV show that used that music in its season three. So if you don't, if you don't know what it is, you can ask me the curator. Oh, one of the best, one of the best TV show ever made, used that music uh, for 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 a little while, which has connection with the US. <laughs> I want, I want to tell you. All right. Um, 
Now, as soon as uh, the, the 63 study was published, it became incredibly controversial. It was immediately noticed, not only by academics, but by the broader public. The New York Times had an op-ed about it. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch also had a long discussion of it, calling it open-eyed torture. So it was extremely controversial. Scientific American, which is a major one of the APA, the American Psychological Association, uh, was um, uh, published an article by this uh, psychologist, Dania Barnbeard, about the ethical violation that were uh, involved in the, uh, the study. Namely, participants were lied about the experiment, and also they definitively were, at the very least, extremely stressed out by the, by the experiment. Milgram's membership to the APA was uh, held up for a year uh, as a result of the ethical inquiry on him until he was actually accepted within the APA. The controversy between Baumreed and a few other people led to the first formula the formulation of the first code of ethics by the APA. Uh, so it has a tremendous impact also on, on the sciences. There's a lot to be said here. Um, uh, in many ways, Milgram was actually in advance uh, compared to what was going on in time. He had the dispatch, he invented the post interview uh, uh, explanation, and so on and so forth. So he did a lot of good things. Uh, but yeah. now, so the work has always been controversial. And what I want to be focusing on in the next 40, 45 minutes is this uh, discussion by Gina Perry, a book published in 2012. Also, I wanted to bring it, but also forgot it at home, which is a very systematic and quite nasty attack on Milgram's work. Uh, she has a bunch of objections. One of them is uh, 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 an ethical objection, you know, very much along the line of what I described earlier, arguing that participants were lied to and were harmed. Second, she has experiment, uh, 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 concerns about uh, experimental design, saying that the assistance that you saw a bit in the clip was going beyond what he, was, what he had been told to do. He was actually pressuring participants mm -hmm. to uh, uh, behave one way. Uh, and the third one, which is the one we're going to be focusing on, is the infinity hypothesis. What does the infinity hypothesis say? It says that uh, Milgram's uh, experiments do not establish the reality of destructive obedience because participants just did not believe that they were harming anyone. They were pretending. They were playing along. They were going along with the psychologists, but they just didn't believe it. And of course, if you don't believe you're harming anyone, you're just going to go along and switch and, 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 pull, and pull the switch one after the other. And so the study uh, by Milgram and his uh, 18 studies published in the 74 books do not establish. It's a very influential book. It has led many people to think that Milgram should be removed from, uh, from, from textbooks, that uh, in fact, that uh, just, just, uh, obedient studies do not show that under minimal constraints, people are willing to violate their own moral codes. What I want to argue, however, in the rest of this lecture is that, in fact, the incredible hypothesis is dead wrong. Uh, uh, there's a minimal grain of truth, but it does nothing to really undermine the reality of this. Right. Uh, let me tell you a bit more about the incredible hypothesis. Uh, uh, Perry got this idea by looking at two different types of documents. So the first one, uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, very quickly, uh, Milgram had done some debrief after the experiment. And when you look at the debrief, you also had a questionnaire to people uh, and to Swiss participants. And the participants sent, sent back the questionnaire to him. And when you look at, this is uh, what you can't see here, when you look at the questionnaire, at the participants' responses, you get things like that. I find it hard to believe that Yed will allow a paid subject to absorb such punishment. His refusal convinced me that it was an experimenter or an unshocked participant. So some people, in their feedback, do express disbelief with respect to the whole uh, experimental setting. Furthermore, we'll come back to that. She's going to use a survey that Taketo, don't worry, it's fine, that Taketo had, Taketo uh, Murata, who was uh, Milgram's, Milgram's assistant, had used. And in that survey, he had asked participants whether or not they believed that someone was harmed. I'll come back to that a little bit later. On, on, the, on the basis of these two sources of evidence, she argues that most participants were actually not credulous. They did not believe the experiment. And as a result, they behave in, the, in a way that shows, that shows nothing about their behavior. She has published the, uh, the same idea, not only in her book, but in a bunch of papers. 
which I'll comment on a little bit later. Notice that uh, this concept is not new, and the idea that participants were just not fooled by the experimental setting is not new at all. It was already discussed right after the publication of Milgram's first paper in 1968. And throughout the discussion of Milgram's work, people have had concerns about really uh, whether participants did actually believe that they were shocking someone. Uh, and in fact, when you think about it, it's a very natural objection, right? I mean, would a psychologist at Yale put you in a room and, and, and would, you, would you really be asked to give a 450 sh uh, volt shock to someone? That's something that strains credulity a little bit. Um, uh, so I think this is um, a reasonable concern. On the other hand, there's something quite strange about the hypothesis. I've shown you the video. People do seem to be quite stressed out. Uh, and if you look at many videos as I've done, there's definitely a large number of participants who had psychological stress during the experiment. All right. Okay. I've told you about the experiment. I've told you about the objection. I want to, in the next few slides, do a slight detour uh, because some of you might think that um, what we're seeing here, Milgram's work, is part of this terrible social psychology that has been done until uh, the last decade and has been decisively undermined by the replication crisis. So I think one question to ask is, is it part of this horrible trend in social psychology, horrible amount of work that we should actually discount and, and send in the dustbin of scientific history? The answer is no. Um, so that's example about psychology, example about uh, uh, the medical sciences, a concern about the quality of science. The reason is no, because Milgram's study differs from uh, bad social psychology in at least three different ways, which are quite important. The first one is one characteristic about bad social psychology is that they tend to test unlikely hypotheses. So I don't know whether you know what this refers to. Um, uh, Vos, who is a very famous psychology, uh, had the hypothesis that working on a messy desk makes you more creative. <laughs> <laughs> on its face, an implausible hypothesis, and she got some striking data supporting this implausible hypothesis, and as a result of the paper in science or nature, whatever. Uh, so one characteristic of bad social psychology, now it does not replicate, as you might expect, <laughs> one characteristic of bad social psychology is a testing of unlikely hypotheses. And there's reasons that the lower your priors are, the more you should be expected, a larger rate of false positive among significant results. Very easy to show, I won't do, I won't do that, I won't do that here. What's, character, what's remarkable in uh, a mid experiment is that it's not implausible in this way. It taps into our experience of the world. That it is actually not that difficult to get perfectly ordinary individual with a normal moral sense to do horrible things with minimum constraints. Uh, many of you, of you know that uh, picture. It's of course in Nazi Germany. It's August Landmesser, who was one of the few people not to uh, not to greet Hitler. Of course, he died in, in a camp as well as his Jewish uh, partner. Uh, but as you can see, everyone else totally happy to welcome Hitler. Uh, and it's before, of course, uh, it's quite early on during Hitler's, it's 1936, so quite early on during his, his dictation. So the hypothesis is not implausible in the way both hypotheses is. The second thing is one of the sources, of course, of um, uh, uh, bad science in psychology anyway, in the medical sciences, is peer hacking, the manipulation of the data has to get significance. You know, you, you can see that when you just map, for example, the p-values or the z-value, which is a statistic, which is the same thing. And uh, you see, oh, 0 0.05 or 2.1, which would be the, the, the z-value for uh, a, a significant result, or nine, uh, will be 1.96. Anyway, um, uh, just uh, around significance, there's a bump of, 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 uh, of, of good statistics, which means people are slightly pushing them around so they can just get the significant one. Okay, let's go key hacking. There's many ways to do that. Notice the uh, remarkable things in uh, uh, Milgram's work. I've already shown you that slide. There's no P hacking because there's no P. There's no statistics. <laughs> and there's no P because you don't need a P. 26 people out of 40 go to 450 volts. You don't need, you know, it's a kind of experiment where statistics become utterly irrelevant. The phenomenon can be eyeballed. You don't need to run stats to discover very fine differences between very noisy measures. Um, so there's no room for key hacking. It's not just needed. 
And the second difference is replicability. Um, so of you who have listened to me have seen that uh, figure many, many, many times. Psycholo social psychology doesn't replicate very well. One third of papers about maybe 40% of papers replicate. The same is true of cancer research. I could have pictured you the cancer research picture. It would be indistinguishable from, from that picture, the same graph, exactly. Um, however, Milgram's experiment has a very good track record of replication. Uh, dozens of replication of that study in many companies. Now, what you find is this variation a little bit as you would be expecting in the number of people who are willing to harm. But that's just, norm it's just normal variation, right? What you don't find in sequence of replication, I've read all of them, is that uh, a study where very few people engage in destructive obedience. Like there's, there's a proportion always very, there's no study where only a handful of people engage in replication. So what we have here is what, what, what might and should have concern about the work that Milgram has done, it's just not the, of the same type as the type of work social psychologists have done that has led to the replication crisis. If it has issue, it's a very different type of problem. Right. I just wanted to make that clear because there's been some kind of confusion about that uh, in the debates about Milgram's experiment in the last decade. People think it's just the same thing as the bad social psychology. So the so, second so small detour I want to do is to is to uh, say one or two things about the ethical objection. Uh, Perry really hates Milgram. I don't know why, but it's just throughout the book, you just feel <laughs> a deep distaste for the man. Uh, you know, she definitively yeah, is out to get him. Um, and, um, you know, I think there are more grounds to be concerned. What I want, and I think there are really more reasons to, to, be, to, object, to be objecting to um, um, Milgram's experiment. I'm going to be running a Milgram study very soon. Uh, but of a different kind. I won't be uh, shocking. Maybe one of you will be a volunteer, but <laughs> uh, uh, in any case, I will be running a Milgram study. I can tell you a bit more about that later. Uh, but it's true that in the original study, many subjects seem to have been uh, stressed out. And here's what she says. For many of the subjects, it's an instrument of torture. And we can see why she says that here. Um, but on the other hand, it seems wrong. You can't really have it both ways. You can't say in the same book with a single mind, it's an instrument of torture, and participants don't believe it. <laughs> no, it's one or the other, right? If participants don't believe it, they're just pretend, you're engaging pretend play, right? If you're engaging pretend play, it's a bit of a bore, it's a bit annoying, maybe it's a bit, you know, I'd rather not be there. This is, this is ridiculous. But you're not going to be tortured. If you're tortured, it's because you believe it, right? So it's, the book is, has this massive inconsistency between her main objection, and she's so driven by her distaste for the man that she does not even see there's something that is at the very least attention, if not an inconsistency between two positions. Anyway, I wanted to also make this ad hominem point about her work. All right, now I want to go back to um, um, uh, the incredulity hypothesis, which is the main focus on, on the paper. Uh, one of the sources of the discussion is that study here, which was done by Taketo Murata. As I mentioned earlier, Taketo Murata is um, that person right here um, in 2013, just 50 years after the, um, uh, the publication of the experiment. And what he did is that he sent participants a survey with a five-point questionnaire asking them about their belief about the reality of the experiment. Did they believe that they were shocking someone? I fully believe the learner was getting painful shocks to, I was certain the learner, the learner was not getting shocked. And then there was a measure of how, of how often each of the, um, 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 of, uh, the number of shocks in that presentation of the data it's dichotomized between obedience, which are the participants that went to 450 volts, and defiant, everyone who stopped before 450 volts. If you stop at 435, you're a defiant participant. Okay? And uh, um, um, Perry uses this data, as I will explain to you in a minute, to argue against for the incredulity hypothesis. Okay, that's a, that's a main source of data. That's Taketo Murata here. Uh, with a biographer of, of Milgram. Now, the first thing to say is, I think this data should be taken with a grain of salt. 
I mean, the retrospective data, they're not data measured during the study. It's years later, uh, Murata sends his survey, get people's feedback. So, you know, every self-report should be covered with question mark. Retrospective self-report comes with two question mark. Retrospective self-report, when you harm someone, when you believe you have someone, comes with three question marks, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, you, you, you've done something that you think is wrong, and then you're asked, did you really believe it? Said, no, no, of course not. I did not, I did not believe that person, right? It's totally reasonable to think that what people are actually doing are providing excuses. I think it's worth keeping that in mind. But I will be bracketing that concern with introspective self-report. I will be taking them at face value. And what I will show you is that even if you take the self-report at face value, it's just not the case that um, most people believed, uh, it's not, not the case that you can explain away the study um, by appealing to the lack of credulity of participants. Okay, there are many ways to look at the data. Here's one way Thierry looks at the data. So she looks at this uh, 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 table and she says, look, so that's, uh, all these numbers are for all the 18 studies that are reported in the 1974 book. So it's not just for one study, it aggregates across many variations of the obedience experiments, right? So uh, it's a bit mixing apple and apples and oranges to some to some degree. But she looks at this and says, "Look, out of the 600 plus participants that took part in a Milgram's experiment, only 139 both were obedient, so went to 450, and fully believed that they were shocking someone. So it's really it's only 21 percent, one out of five at most, really engage in obedience." destructive obedience. And from that she says, well, maybe that's a bit more than what we would like, but it's definitely far from the claim that the majority of us is actually willing to engage in destructive obedience. Okay, this is the first way to look at, at the data, and she does that in, in, the, in the book. Now, the first thing to say is, I think this, this quite misses the point of uh, Milgram's experiment. Milgram's experiment, the reason why it's interesting it's because of the moral nature of the project. It's because whether you are easily willing to break what you think is the right, not to do what you think is the right thing to do. Now, if you believe that you're shocking some, someone, if you believe that you are probably shocking someone, if you believe that you might be shocking someone, in all these cases, I maintain it is wrong to shock someone. It's only if you're certain that you're not shocking someone, that maybe it's okay not to, not, not, not to impose a shock. So from a, from a moral point of view, what really matters is not just that cell here. From a moral point of view, it's, it's at the very least those three cells. I fully believe, I probably, I believe that I'm probably shocking someone, I believe I might be shocking someone. In any of these situations, if you're a decent person, or even if you're a decent person, but not influenced by, by uh, someone else, you should not be shocking. Uh, and that brings us already to, to, to one, out, one, out, one out of three participants. But in any case, I don't think this is the right way to be thinking about the data. Nor no, does Kevin, it's just a first pass at it. So the right way to be thinking is whether credulity has an impact on people's willingness to harm to the maximum, right? And that's very easy to test. You can just uh, correlate that. This is what I did here. You can just distribute the participants between those that are defiant, they stop before 4.15. So they might stop at 4.35, but they stop before uh, 4.50. And whether they're obedient, they go until, until 4.50. This is a degree of credulity. One means that they really believe that they are shocking someone, they're fully certain. Five, they're not certain at all. Probably, possibly uncertain, certain. And what you can see is that there is a negative correlation between whether or not you believe that you are shocking someone and whether or not you are defiant. So here, the thing to say are two things. First, there's a grain of truth in what Perry is saying. If you're skeptical of the experiment, you're more likely to go along. If you really take it seriously, you're slightly more likely to, uh, uh, to be different, as it is here. Right? So there's a small grain of truth, that's the first thing to be said. But the second thing to be said, and I hope you see it right here, is that the effect size is very small. Well, it's small, right? So it is true that uh, when you are uh, really believing it, you're slightly, less like, you're slightly less likely to comply, but it's only just a very small effect size. And I think that just should settle the matter. 
Yeah, there's a true effect size, so the true effect, but it's a very minute one. And so you can't explain away destructive obedience by appealing to trade unity. It doesn't in, in uh, Perry's work. Why doesn't it? Well, because she does some statistics. And here's it from a 2020 paper. So what she does in that uh, paper, the 20 paper, 2020 paper I mentioned earlier, is fit to a logistic regression model. Uh, the first model here and the second model here. So the first model takes whether or not you believe that you're harming someone and dichotomize it. So if you say one, two, uh, you believe, and you believe that you're probably harming someone, you get one. If you believe that you're certain that you're not harming someone and you say four, you get two. Number three are set aside, right? So you dichotomize the measure, okay? And then you do a, log a logistic regression by uh, uh, using this dichotomized measure of belief to predict defiance and obedience. And as you can see, you get a significant model here uh, with an odd ratio of 2.5, uh, which means the odd ratio that you're likely to, uh, the odd ratio between um, uh, um, harming or shocking if you uh, are uh, uh, um, uh, credulous and shocking if you're not credulous. I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm a bit impressed right here. Uh, is 2.5, okay? It's, and it's significant. There's something a bit fishy in removing part of your data, but I, I just I just won't, won't, won't worry about that too much. And then she runs a second model, mostly because it's quite fishy to just throw one, one field of your data. But uh, she runs a second model where she includes all the data, all the five scale. It's also a logistic regression model. And what you can see, the model is also significant overall. And what you can see is that people who answer once are certain that they're harming someone are significantly, significantly more likely to uh, shock than people who answer five, or well, people who are certain they're not hurting anyone. Okay, so she does some. Uh, she does this two fairly simple uh, statistical analysis, and from that she concludes that uh, the effect is highly significant, both statistically and substantively, and people's willingness to harm is strongly affected by their credulity and and and, and uh, whether they're credulous or not, and you get dramatic variation. Uh, this is our conclusion. Let me explain to you because um, I, I will spend a, a couple of minutes on that. So what you have in red are just a summary of the data. Another ratio of 2.15 in the first model and uh, another ratio of uh, 3.6 in the second model, okay, with respect to reference category. What you get in yellow are uh, gloss, a verbal gloss on that. Let me just read the first one. Suggesting that those who had a high level of belief that the shocks were real were 2.57 uh, times, 2.57 times more likely to be defiant than those who had a low level. 2.57 times, that's a real effect. So credibility seems to matter quite a bit. And then you get, as, in the end, you get to the things highly significant, both statistically and, and, and substan substan substantively. And she says the same type of rhetoric there for the, for the second model. Now, it does not fit very well with what I showed you earlier. Earlier, I showed you a correlation, a small correlation, a small effect size. Here, we get 2.57 times. This is a huge effect. It's actually very worried. What's going on? Who is wrong? Right. She's wrong. In case you get the tweet. It's as a mess as it can get. Uh, OK, so first thing to say is odds ratio are creature from hell. <laughs> they are creature from hell. No one understands them. You can't gloss them verbally without tripping in yourself. Uh, they are the output of uh, logistic regression. So that's what you report in a table. But you can't, they're, they're anything but intuitive. And, and, and they don't correspond to what you want to say mm. at all. So she does get an odds ratio, which is significant. And that's an odd ratio. It's a ratio of two ratio. That's the definition of an odd ratio in her case. But really, what she wants to tell us is about relative risk, right? A relative risk is take, for example, it's a proportion in this case of different people among people who are credulous. It's a proportion of different people among people who are skeptical. This is a relative risk. Odds ratio are not that. Odds ratio are a ratio of ratio. Now, what you see in yellow, is a gloss for a relative risk. So she's confusing in her description relative risks and odds ratio. 
So, uh, and that's why it's so impressive. A relative risk of 2.5, it's actually genuinely su a substantive effect. Another ratio of 2.5, of 2.5, it's actually not a genuinely very large effect. So she's actually, she does the same thing when she, she glosses over model two. She just confuses two different measure of effect sizes. And I can't blame her. Everyone does that. So very well-known issues are the ratio. It's a just, there's no way to gloss them verbally in a way that's easily communicable. But people think they see another ratio, people trust that to relative risk, and then they get very excited. The second thing is that because she's confusing odds ratio and relative risk, relative risk, she's misinterpreting how big her effect is. An odds ratio of two or even three is actually not a very large odds ratio. Uh, a relative risk of two or 2.5 or three would be a very large, a very large effect. So here are just some number. Let's suppose you've got among your different people, 66% of credulous, 50% 50, 50 of skeptical. The odds ratio would be two. Relative risk would be 1.32. <laughs> if you've got 60 to 40, so there would be a, a, an effect of credulity on, on the behavior of, de of deficiency. You know, it's, it's not a, a small effect, it's a real effect, but it's not enormous. You would get an odds ratio of three, which is larger than what she gets. And then not in a relative risk of 1.5. It's just to help you anchor your intuition about effect sizes there, right? As soon as you keep in mind the distinction between odds ratio and relative risk, what you find out is that while well, there is an effect, as I showed you by just doing a simple of correlation, the effect is genuine, but actually of quite small size. And so you can't explain away the incredulity hypothesis by just looking at people who are credulous versus who are skeptical. So what's the upshot of, of this uh, discussion is that there is a genuine effect. You know, people who are credulous are actually more likely to just say no before the end of the experiment, but only a tiny so. Uh, again, this is just to give you a sense of effect sizes. Effect sizes are just very hard to intuitively grasp. This is effect size of Cohen 0.2. It means that between the two distributions of 83% of overlap, this is a Cohen effect size of 0.5. It means that between the two distributions, there's 67% overlap. We have an effect size of 0.3 if you look at the correlation. So it's much more like that than like this. So there is again an effect of credulity. It's a tiny effect, or it's a small effect on people's willingness to harm or not. Okay. The second, so that is the first type of data. Uh, the, the survey. The second type of data she uses on is this um, uh, interviews that Milgram has done. And in the interview, people explain their behavior by the sense that the learner was not being harmed. And many people say that. The learner was not being harmed. That's why I kept going. Now, the same concern about justifying yourself, providing an excuse for, for your behavior applies there as well. But I do think it's a mistake to use those data to try to support the incredulity hypothesis. Why is that? Like, for example, uh, Hollander and Chorovelsky. Because there's a confusion between harming and hurting. People know they're not harming. They're told like 5,000 times during the experiment, you're not harming the participant. But it's very clear that they believe they're hurting that person, right? And so, of course, the question here is that, is it morally acceptable to hurt someone? even if you don't harm her? Me thinks not. Uh, I don't know what you think, uh, but me thinks not. Um, um, so I think that's, that, that kind of data about not harming is totally irrelevant, again, for the incredibility hypothesis. And the last type of data I wanted to mention that in Perry is unfortunately not discussing comes from the book. These are the numbers from the 40, for the first four studies, it's about 139, uh, I think 130, about 130 participants. Um, and uh, this is by his conditions in the study. What uh, Milgram did is that post hoc, I believe post hoc, he sent them a scale or he had them feel a scale from one to 14, one being the participants feel no pain, 14 being the participants feel excruciating pain. And what you can see, this is the obedient participants, so we'll go to the end, this is defiant participants. And this is for all the various studies, uh, um, um, and assesses the mean. So there's no standard deviation, unfortunately, so I wasn't able to do a, a proper meta-analysis here of, of the data. I could have inputted some standard deviation, but I decided not to do it. What I just did for your uh, value is so that you can visualize the data. I just plot the data. This is the defiant participant. This is the obedient participant. This is the mean. 
And as you can see, there's basically no difference between, between the conditions. So people believe that they're inflicting pain to the same degree, whether or, uh, independently of their willingness to uh, stop before the end or to go, to go into the end. And again, that suggests people really were, were thinking they were harming other people. Thank you. Conclusions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. To conclude, uh, Milgram's obedience studies are definitely not beyond ethical and methodological criticism. I think there's very serious ethical concern with what he has done. I think it's a really genuine question. If you read the work, it feels very outdated in the way to do science. It's very narrative, no measure of uncertainty is reported. You know, it's it's very amateurish in many ways. Uh, so it's actually very refreshing. Uh, you know, you see, oh, this is breezy, this is pleasant. <laughs> but definitely, <laughs> uh, this is not one of these you know, formatted articles you would read this day in a social psychology journal. So there's a lot of exciting things in reading that kind of work. But it's definitely some very serious issues. You know, not reporting standard deviation when you report a mean is just bad form, I think. Um, so there's many reasons to be very concerned about what uh, Mingram has done. Uh, but I do think that the impunity objection does very little to undermine, to undermine the usual interpretation of these studies. Um, um, and it does seem that, I think, unfortunately, uh, destructive obedience seems to be a real phenomenon that most of us, um, in, in fact, you know, 37 out of 40 in this room, uh, no, 20, 27 out of 40 in this room uh, are probably willing to uh, go the maximum degree of pain to uh, someone under minimal constraint. Um, and I think this is actually quite a disturbing fact about ourselves that I think it's worth, it's actually worth knowing. And I think this is the way we should feel when we read uh, that study and, and it's, it's for us, that's the truth about it. All right, before concluding, I'd like to thank my uh, co authors on this uh, project. John Doris, who was actually the, uh, was actually the lead on this uh, uh, project, he got started uh, to, uh, to get that uh, doing. If you have objections, uh, I'll give you his email. Uh, and uh, uh, Laura Nimi, who's a psychologist at, uh, at uh, Cornell uh, as well. All right, thanks for your attention. <laughs> All right, let's take a five minute break. Let's take a break and let's take a break. Thank you, Mr. I sent you the object. Oh, yeah. I don't know. 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 I I more value. And it would help me get Well, I don't know how he's going to do it. Yeah, the Iranian lab. She does like. I had a friend who the IRB. I'm actually on the IRB, so all of his stuff got. And all this to being fired for the And all of fiber snap next I looked into that. Fortunately, didn't find any article with the job. I think next summer, all fibers. Yes, it's really ends up being Okay. used to be a place where uh, there were really no rules. Yeah. Uh, just kind of a uh, you're, you're in. That's uh, 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 you mean if you're like already faculty? Yeah. I think you know, you can like you can have a lot of people. Yeah. 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 Ye
join a team that has a PI yeah. and then be. Do you have to? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And then I have plans. Yeah. 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 So what you had was four people who were from the colony and four people who were not. No, I know. Because in the first case, I think that all the people from your college, and that teacher told me that they don't want to take part of it. Okay, I'll okay. Or in some cases, they do each other because they don't like the cost of the way they're going to do it. Those things are better, but if you mean all of them, and it's like every day, you're going to go to the broader area. And then, of course, yeah, I think I'll be back. But also, you can only do it if you're a grad student. There's a lot of sad, but have to be doing it until they're bored. Anyone. Assuming I make it out of the post and I'm going to be a purgatory. That's Yeah, I'm going to accept it, but I'm just waiting. The department chair was allowed to be there to serve as a well. I'm going to accept it. Yes. So if you thought they were mounting, I believe are part of the and your advisor. But you think you're not from the Texas and point out things that you for yourself. So I did that for two. Yeah. I've only been there once during the summer. It was really one nice. Boom, obviously in the summer. All right, let's uh, let's uh, reconvene. I'll do a uh, office of okay, Cindy, go first. Yeah, welcome, welcome, Canada. Well, this is terrifying, but um, so I'm wondering, I mean, has there been since it's such a staple in the literature? Or have there been studies to indicate what other kinds of conditions might change that would change the willingness that would have just about the willingness? Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is there, is there a follow up? Uh... No, I want to know what they are. <laughs> yeah. And how do we implement them as so good? So, so people have been looking, of course, at every single yeah. possible either moderators or um, um, mediators for the effect. Yeah. Um, Milgram himself was, of course, uh, so that's why he did 18 studies looking at many possible variations in um, as a willingness to harm or to hurt. Um, and personality does not seem to matter a whole lot. So there was a study of the participants, the original studies, they didn't seem to be pervert at all. You know, that's it, the study is sometimes not understood as showing that we are bad people, which is definitely not what the study mm -hmm. shows. It's a study about obedience, not about uh, bad disposition. So personality does not seem to matter a whole lot. Um, what seems to, to matter is being, as you would be expecting, being close to the person who is, who is hurt. That actually decreases your likelihood that you're going to be helping. Distance between you and the person who is giving you order matters tremendously. People. If you if you receive the uh, if you receive the four prompts by a psychologist from a phone, you're much more likely to stop. So the physical presence of an individual uh, is actually has a tremendous impact. So we know such a kind of things that that really matter. I'm not sure if it was exactly the question you were asking. The question you were asking how to protect ourselves from being manipulated into obedience, and that actually I'm not quite sure what the what, what the response is. Um, I suppose maybe projecting oneself. In the pen, that um, uh, you know, because we know that seeing the pen does have an impact. So maybe imagining the pen or the hurt that someone is, but I don't, I don't know about that. Is that a follow-up question? Or? Well, it's related. I, I, I don't remember about, about this, but did Mil Milgram do or have other people done a variation to go immediately from a very low voltage? Uh, to the max? Yeah. Uh, uh, obviously, it, it seems as though they 
I mean, intuitively, the, the incremental character, the increase, it makes people more likely to um, uh, it's to fly, and I, that would uh, I mean, it would be interesting to know. Yeah. 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 To my knowledge, to my knowledge, good question. To my knowledge, I don't not none of the studies in about like forty or fifty or then no one did that kind of manipulation. Um, it might matter because we know that uh, the first time a learner complains, that this is where the drop, right? So um, I suppose moving from 15 to 4 to 450 would make the gap very thin. That would be an, something that would be very noticeable in the same way that giving the learner makes, introduces a discontinuity in, 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 the, in, the, in the transition from, if, or, uh, from 15 to 450. Yeah. I have a more general question. Then you want to go to someone okay, so I'll, I'll, put, you, I'll put, you, put you in the list. You had a question on the side? Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. Is that a follow-up? Next one, Sidas, go for it. Oh, thank you. First of all, I enjoyed the reference with the Americans. Uh, was, uh, <laughs> it, was not, it was not the Americans. Oh. It was reused in the Americans in the 1990s. Oh. I wouldn't call the, the Americans one of the greatest shows oh, on earth. Well, it's actually, <laughs> well, it's actually a decent TV show. It is not, it's much better than the Americans. Okay. Try, try again. <laughs> uh, so the question is a slightly pedantic point, I suppose, because you define the destructive obedience thesis as requiring knowledge of harm. Yes. And if knowledge is factored, then this, these experiments are not. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. believe, believe. Okay. Um, so I actually don't think that knowledge is factive in everyday English. Okay. For that, for, for for that matter, I think knowledge is polysemous. Uh, okay. To know that is polysemous in English has factive users and non-factive users. I actually think no word is polysemous uh, from the semantic reason. It's a pragmatic phenomenon. Uh, so <laughs> I thought I'd be happy to uh, to go there if you want. I I have other questions, but you okay. can put me down. I'll put you back. Uh, have you? Um, awesome. I love this. Uh, it's very fun to go back to my roots. I think, um, culture <laughs> Sorry, <what? laughs> culture no, 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 back to your roots. <laughs> it reminds me of being back in a psychology talk, but uh, I have to admit, so you know, that must have been the, the episode must have been from Friends, right? Because it was clearly the best. Thanks, all right. You see, I wasn't that off. Okay, real question. Um, so incredulity seems a little weird to me in the sense that, like, could you possibly, like, an, is, is, an, is it a fair extension of the idea of the hypothesis that if you make people disbelieve that they're, or like not, not really believe that they're actually harming somebody, then it would be even more likely for them to go along, right? That's the whole idea of incredulity, right? Yeah, that's right. So basically, if you want to prompt obedience, you just have to make people, according to this view, then you just have to prompt people to Yes, think that they're not actually harming anything that's right. by doing it. That's right. So it's it's actually a nice, a nice twist of the study. That's not the way Chris Perry thinks about her objection, but it, it's a co direct consequence of dehumanization. You might think if you dehumanize right. victims of harm or of, uh, of which seems consistent with like actual how how this stuff happens in practice. So it might be that like there's two different vehicles that are occurring. That like, yes. maybe it doesn't matter whether you disbelieve it or do believe it you end up in the same in the same place of destructive obedience. I mean, you could argue that there's a pathway like that. I guess my issue is something like, when would we predict that incredulity might actually show an effect that uh, uh, reduces obedience, I guess? So it's, it's uh, um, so, I'm, so I, I was following you until you asked the question. <laughs> uh, so, so I agree with you that there's a spin on her own hypothesis that's very pessimistic. That, yeah. um, this is definitely not what she has in mind. She has in mind explaining a specific experimental result uh, by the nonce, by arguing that participants were just not taking the premises of the experiment for granted, right? So, whether or not you can extend this idea to the why, one might say, is, is not as clear as, as it might seem. On the other hand, you're quite right. It, it is a common idea that one of the mechanisms by which harm is easily inflicted on others is by dehumanizing others. And one of the effects of dehumanization is presenting others as people who feel less than. You know, there's a large literature on African Americans being being described as actually being much less sensitive to pain than than, than white Americans in the 19th century. 
so, that, so, so I think this is quite quite right uh, that uh, there's a spin on a hypothesis that's also quite quite pessimistic. I'm, I'm not going to answer the question because I didn't quite get the question. Well, I know, Paul. I can I can rephrase it, but you can also put it in the back. So I can put it back in the queue. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I first like to point out that Sudar and Zaria answered the question wrong, and there's obviously a consequence for that. This is this is actually repeating something that we discussed at dinner the other day. That's helping us frame it. I mean, here's a variant of the incredulity hypothesis that worries me. I mean. One way to think about what you might do during the experiment is thinking, yes, I believe I'm hurting people. Um, yes, I'm finding this emotion uncomfortable. But I also believe that what I'm doing is ethical because I've been reassured by the professionals yes. who hired me to do it. Yes. And while we might worry about people outsourcing their ethical judgments that way, in their defense, they were correct. This is after you saw the Alexander Haslam's hypothesis is very much along this line, that having an experimenter near you that provides you with the social backing and I would believe the moral backing um, uh, of, of um, the place of science in society. And indeed provide, for, so maybe pro uh, it's wrong to do that, but everything considered, uh, one might think the participants is not violating uh, 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 moral commitment. Now, I think this is a reasonable thing to say. I'm quite skeptical that if, or if that's what's going on in people's minds, they need to get ethics 101 because sending 450 shocks to people, it's not simply potential wrong, it's everything considered wrong. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, contributing, to, contributing to the progress of science is one thing. I think this is a valuable thing. Uh, uh, it's hard for me to imagine, uh, first from a normative point of view, that it would be the right thing to do, and then from a psychological point of view, I find it not fully plausible that people would. Um, like be convinced by this kind of, of, of training of the two possible I can push back just a little bit. Yeah. I mean, um, you, I, I would have, if, if, you, if you put me in the experiment right now, I would have a quite, you know, just like some random psychological experiment, I would have quite a high skepticism by a first order concerns about the ethics because yeah. I have quite a high level of trust. Yeah in the scientific community and its ethics framework um, and I'm, you know, I'm, in, I'm, in fact, I'm fairly informed about that, and in fact, the rules, I know the rules for ethics frameworks are in fact a lot better now than they were at that time, but equally, it's trusted the science is higher, it's not at all impossible to think of scenarios in which relatively large amounts of harm, a bit, bit of a section of primates, say, of is justified yeah. for some greater good, and, the, you know, the, you, you can, you, 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 I, you I, imagine, like, I, I can't think of the situation in which this would be okay, but the but the people at Yale have told me it is like, yeah. surely they know. Good, good, good. So, so I think, I think this is, uh, so my view is that it's part of the story, but I think only part of the story for various reasons. So the first one is the experiment is done out of Yale in many different settings where you manipulate um, the prestige of the institution back in one reason. It's also done for things that don't really involve a learning experiment. Uh, you know, so the one I plan to do is to compel people to uh, uh, to incentivize people with my friendly voice uh, to, to do some things that they find unpleasant to themselves. So not, not to others, uh, so harm themselves uh, or to hurt themselves, not harm themselves. Uh, so put them in a task that's actually unpleasant or they want to get out as soon as they can. And they say, I want to stop. So, Please continue. <laughs> you must continue. Please continue. So, uh, um, and, and so here is as you, know, you remove a little bit the setting of, of, of the learning things about the world. Uh, you can put it in terms of fairly practical application. Um, um, and so and I, 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 it has been done by Nick Aslam and other psychologists. You get similar results. So I think it is part of the story. There's no doubt about that. Um, I don't think it's a whole, the whole explanation. Yeah. Um, as I have to do, uh, Ma. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so this, I know this wasn't the, the main focus, but I did find your dismissal of Harry's objections that the participants didn't believe they were harming the people. 
um, and the claim that it wasn't a trauma or that it was traumatizing mm -hmm. done in detention. I didn't, I found that a bit glib, right? Because we know, we know that people are very strong and long lasting emotional reactions to things that they don't believe to be true, right? Like most of our reactions to films and to fiction are premised on things that aren't true in the real world, having very you know, strong influence on so how we feel. You think you're torturing yourself when you go see a horror movie? To me, it's incredibly abusive, yeah. And to most people, it isn't. That's why they said they're making so much money. <laughs> I mean, uh, sometimes it is. I think a lot of people speak it out for that reason. But I just, I mean, it's not given that there is this perfect um, no, that, alignment that, that, I, I, so, and their emotions, and it, it might have some bearing on claims where threats are appealing to like their overt emotional reactions as some evidence yeah, of what I, their beliefs it was. And I just don't think that our emotions yeah. really line up with our beliefs. I thought that you agree about that. So um um I see that. so in the paper we do discuss this kind of, of, of consideration. So I think it is true that uh, even if you don't believe uh, that you are doing something you might even pretending that you are doing something you might actually get an uh, an emotional reaction, you know. So uh, Fakhari Kushman has done this very nice work where you have a hammer and you have a hand which is ne right near your hand, except it's not your hand, it's a rubber hand. And you have to bang with a hammer on the rubber hand, that is where you, you think your hand might well be. And people are, while fully knowing full well they're not hurting anyone's hand, uh, they are actually uh, having aversive reaction to that. You take a knife, a fake knife, you try to stab someone, knowing you're not going to stab anyone, people are actually having aversive. So, so the point is very well taken. Nonetheless, in none of these studies do you get the type of aversion you get in, um, in uh, Wilbram's work. Right? So if you look at the kind of things that Pairi uh, report, Pairi Cushman's report, people do report aversion. People do report having a negative emotion, they do report some degree of aversion, they do not report the stress that you find in, in Milton's work. Uh, and the same is true, of course, of, of movies, right? I don't go to movies, to horror movies either, because I really don't like them, because mm -hmm. I would have a genuine aversion, a regular aversion. People who go there tend not to have those kind of aversion. I mean, even if they have a negative emotion, just not at the same time. There's a lot of people on the <laughs> so yeah, but, but just think the point is well, the point is well taken. There's more to be said. That's why I didn't say that it's inconsistent. I think there's an attention. There's a, a few things you might want to say. I don't know whether I where should go. Uh, very quick follow up then. Yeah. I, I mean, super quick, just as a matter of evidence, the Jesus. I take it she's not saying uh, Milton's experiments are torture, just like loads of other psychology experiments and just like Hobbit movies. No. Jim. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd be interested um, to hear your reflections about, about this. But, uh, one of the things about the uh, Milgram experiments that is so persuasive is the way in which he varies, he varies the conditions in all sorts of ways. And at least uh, under the conditions he explores, he gets to, uh, largely the same effect. My impression is, is that this is much less done in social psychology these days, at least by some some researchers, it, it's more if you can find one condition where the effect appears, That's right. uh, then you, you you kind of go with that. And, and that strikes me as kind of methodologically uh, much, you know, much less good than uh, than what uh, Milgram did. Am, am I wrong in that? No, I think, you, I, I, I think I think you're quite right. I mean, the social psychologists would point to some variations that they also do, but it's a much smaller in many ways than what Milgram did. Milgram investigated the basic effect in 24 studies and tried to vary as many things as possible to identify the boundary conditions of the effect in the, in the moderators. In a way that very few people do these days, um, I think there was a care about trying to understand the phenomenon, um, a basic phenomenon, trying to see exactly what moderates it, that many psychologists don't really do these days. That's why we published it in a book. And not right. he published it in a book, yeah. and not not in one article that he had to rush to press. Uh, you know, you, you could see he was taking his time really to to put to put everything together and try to understand what he was doing. Modern psychologists don't do this kind of things by and large. Uh, they do much smaller variation. A part, however, of psychology where you might find that, and that ones that you know well, is develop, developmental psychology. 
you know, in the Lisbelki Sukhari tradition, where you do find also over decades there, uh, a very systematic investigation of some of the looking time paradigms. You, know, you, you, vary, you vary a little bit uh, the stimuli, you vary a little bit how the object falls, you vary a little bit the connection between two objects for causation. So you do find some attempt there to, to vary the, the experimental conditions. And I guess I, I'd like to declare myself interest here in thinking in terms of the Woodward Bogan notion of yes. phenomena, where, where finding, you know, finding a phenomenon is finding something that's there's somewhat robust. Kind of Absolutely. Theory. Absolutely. I mean, what, what's really remarkable if you compare the, the Vos study, which I mentioned about the messy desk and creativity, you know, Jennifer Vos studies that I alluded to earlier, and the Migram, Vos is a one off study. Yeah. You know, it's, she got messy, she got messy desk. She's got creativity. She sent it to a journal and then move on to another, move on to another project. And there's no, effect, there's no attempt to try to understand what's going on. I think that's that's okay. Yeah. Um, fine. Yeah. So, um, I am convinced by the sort of statistical analysis and things that that you've shown that the um, incredulity hypothesis doesn't do as much as Perry wants it to do. Yeah. Well, no, less. Um. Throughout the talk, though, there's this there's a suggestion that the upshot here of the robustness of this phenomena is that under pretty minimal constraints, people will do it. Yeah. And I'm wondering really how minimal these constraints yeah. are. So I'm wondering if in one of the slides in the latter half, there was, I, I think, one of the Perry papers about uh, asking participants what they thought. And it was all this nice, I think further up, but maybe. Or maybe that one, yeah, all this nice. Um, red highlighting. Yeah, good. Um, so yeah, so they classified the people's justification for group. The justification. Following instructions, learner was not really being harmed, importance of the experiment in fulfilling a contract. Right, fulfilling a contract. This seems like a really significant piece of the moral reasoning here, right? If I come across someone doing this along the street and they just ask me to do it uh, and I watch it happening, and I see it all before deciding to join to sign up for this. You know, maybe I watch this happen and I get a feel for what the experimenters do, you know, what the the thing looks like, really, when I've been asked to do it. And then I have had some time to think about it. And I say, no, I'm not going to sign that contract, even if it's a thousand dollars or whatever. You know, um, but then it sounds like in this situation, uh, that's not what's happened. It's you've been asked to do this thing. It's for science. To David's point, there's all this expectation of the ethics being worked out and as you for each thing have to decide am i going to keep going mm -hmm. it's have i gotten to the threshold where i will renege on my contract uh and so i wonder if, if what do you what do you think about the degree to which that really complicates the level of constraints here and um it, you know how much does this real given that you know is this more about the nature of moral reasoning and how uh, complicated moral reasoning, in fact, is, or, or is this really about? Uh, I'm just not buying that the constraints are minimal. Yes, uh, I, I, know, I, think, I think that's a fair question indeed. Uh, it's a there's many aspects of uh, David was mentioning as well as you mentioning many aspects of the decision process each participant has to go through. There is something like an implicit contract that any participant is you know, going to allow sign on, you know, you are going there, you're going to get some money, credits or whatever. And in exchange, you are going to take part in a, in a study. There's a trust relation between you and the experimenter, but it's a big context. Uh, you're trusting the experimenter. So all of that are indeed constraints that uh, determine your behavior. And in addition to that, there are the uh, script that the assistant is doing. So these are part of the constraints uh, that are relevant for uh, what each participant is, has to do, has to decide throughout the study. Whether they're minimal or not is a good question. It's, it's hard to say what a minimal set of constraints amount to. It strikes me when we're not doing the experiment and we have a code minder that, ha that you know, giving someone a 450 shock, 450 volt shock, should override any of this consideration. If I were to ask you now, outside the experiment, do that, you wouldn't do it. If I were, if I asked you whether you should do it 
even knowing, no, uh, uh, if I should call it a factual, if you were part of, part of an experiment, like if you were a participant, if you had John, would you, or would it be morally acceptable, yeah. should you uh, do that? You were going to tell me no. Mm -hmm. You're going to say no, actually, this act, you know, the, the hurt or the pain, the harm maybe, but definitely the pain I would be inflicting other ways, the you know, other considerations I might have in that. Now, maybe they're not minimal in, 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 in some sense. But they're definitely, they're definitely um, not of the same kind as harming or hurting someone. So, so that's, that's my, that's, I think, the, the response, right? Uh, yeah, can I follow up briefly yeah. then? Yeah. Uh, so you have these other considerations, and they shouldn't, they certainly don't override the level of harm that's being inflicted, this consequence. Yeah. We all see how terrible that is. <clears throat> but there are so many cases in which, um, uh, we think of some degree of pain as worthwhile to get to some greater good, right? Like decades ago, corporal punishment for child rearing was very common mm -hmm. and an unpleasant experience for child and parent, but well regarded, widely regarded as for the child's good. And they, these cases sort of subtly give you that idea too, I say, this is a learner. You're giving them negative reinforcement to help them learn. There's this purposefulness <laughs> to it that's suggestive. Um, I, I do think you. I do think there's a bit of truth there. What's not right, however, is that the learner tells you, "Get me out." Yeah, yeah. And you don't. <laughs> the learner tells you, "Get me out," and you, nope, nope, nope. No, no one's doing that. Everyone's going. Yes, <laughs> that, that, that is to my point. Everyone recognizes they are doing something wrong. Everyone knows they're doing something wrong. They know that they should not be doing that, and they still do it. You know, yeah, good. Yeah, I, but but I agree with you. So minimal might not be quite the right word because it's true there are a set of constraints that that determine behavior. Um, I think that's why I think that that that's actually a fair a, a fair objection. And it is true that it is a a multi determining factor, right? It's very clear at the beginning. Why do you go for fifty? The person say, "Ouch!" Why do you keep going? Well, I think totally reasonable. Right? Yeah. Pen, you know, maybe a small pen. Okay, let let's keep going. Doesn't really doesn't really matter. Uh, Randall, I think there's a bunch of people. Any right? And then we start. Miami Vice. <laughs> Miami Vice. Miami Vice. That is right. <laughs> and I said, well, the greatest TV show. It's such a good TV show. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think actually, if you're a bit younger than me, you probably don't know Miami Vice, but that's a movie that's not nearly as good as the show. But, uh, <laughs> so, um, is the difference between these experiments we're talking about? Um, and the Zimbardo yes. uh, experiment, the fact that the, the harm or the hurt in, in Zimbardo was so vivid, so undeniable, so clear, or, you know, what I think, what, I think there are many differences. So the two go together, if you open a textbook, you will find Zimbardo, Zimbardo's prison experiment together with uh, Milgram's evidence studies. They're very different, very different. Uh, Zimbardo stuff is deeply problematic from not only moral but also experimental point of view. It's not replicated in many. No. We talked about never exploring the phenomenon. It's been replicated a handful of times, but but you know it's it's just a very different type of of study. Um, in, in this one, it's a very small number of participants. It does really, I suspect, much more get into the bad people uh, among your participants rather than just a phenomenon of obedience. Um, you know, I think it just derived um, because there is some participants in, Zimba in Zimbardo studies that really behaves in an appalling manner. Uh, while here, it's just it's a progressive nature, the, 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 the social context, the instruction. I think the, the, the two type onto quite different phenomena. So to summarize, I think Zimbardo study is just a bad study. It might well replicate if we were to do it again. But I think it's just, just literally just bad science. Okay. While this one is actually much not not great, but much better science. That's so, the so phenomenon. I'm not sure that's the same. Yeah. Uh, in, in in the in the questions you you fielded already, we talked about the contract. We we, we talked about the uh, the roles that that the 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 people in uh, 
in the Milgram experience had the experimenter, the, uh, the, the teacher, the subject, and, and then it was just too damn far uh, that, that the, uh, the Stanford experiment went with regard to the role yeah. playing. It, it was unconstrained. So I, I want to still, uh, that may be the, the, the one thing that, that distinguishes between the two. I can't find as many differences between them as, as you do. I don't know. I, I do think, um, you know, uh, Zimbardo chose the people who were going to be involved. He rejected some. Uh, you know, th there's a lot of different things going on between what Zimbardo did and what 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 Milgram did. Um, if I read the last word and then stop there. Oh yeah, I just wanted to. Um, you did grant Harry the small effect size, the capability of the clients, but I just wanted to. You did call into question why the obedient participants would want to, you know, give excuses. But I just wanted to offer that um, defiant participants uh, are end up being more praiseworthy, or it makes more sense to defy it and believe the experimental conditions. So there's also motive, like an aesthetic motivation on their end to tabulate. So I just don't really even even the small effect size. I think uh, there's reason on both sides. To, yeah. So. Indicated, so. I, I, I think that's a fair point. I, I think we should take, I was just taking for granted that the uh, survey was measuring what it was meant, meant, meant to measure for this the analysis. But yes, there's many reasons to be skeptical of this. All right, I think we should stop here. Thank you. <laughs>